Is this going to be multilingual or all English? Uh, English. English. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. Because that was confusing me. So, Mitten. Zoe Mitten live. It's interesting how Antwerp's such a different vibe from Brussels. Oh, yes, completely. Ma- massively yeah. different. Brussels is very international. Yeah. Whereas I love Antwerp, I love living here. Yeah. But it's kind of like a village city. Mm. <coughs> Nobody wants to admit it because Antwerpians, are, people from Antwerp are really proud. Yeah. Proud people. Yeah, but, but they should really be proud like of their parochialism. It's yes, like, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We're strong enough to have our own identity. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, Brussels is great. Yeah. Have you have you been to Brussels this this time around or like No, no, no. I've been been before. Morris, can take a microphone or Oh, yes, of course, but we are live already. Oh, we're, oh, we're live. live. Okay, we're rolling. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, do you want it up there? But I'm short. Um so a little bit up tomorrow. Yeah, that's There. Okay. Test test um, I didn't know we started. Sorry. It's all good. It's all good. They're going to edit anyway. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's live. We're live. We're live now. now. Oh. So if we badmouth people now, it could ruin our, 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 our careers. careers. If I say something that's going to be on Twitter, Chaponda, Chaponda says racist thing about Brussels yeah, and yeah. Antwerp. He doesn't like Antwerp. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Yeah. Oh, no. People from Antwerp heard me say now that we live in a village city. Exactly. Oh no, my career. No, villages are wonderful places. Yes. So where where do you live, uh, Delisa? So I live in Manchester, actually. Okay. Manchester, uh, but like a lot of comedians, I don't really live in Manchester. Mm -hmm. I live in hotels. Yeah. All around the world, because really Manchester is where my mail goes. You know, it's it's my address, (laughs) physical address, where the mail sent to me goes. Yes. And like last week, for example, I think I was home for two days of the week. Wow. Right. And sometimes I'm not home for, you know, three weeks. So it's just, it's where my address is, but I go to wherever shows are. And so how is that? Like, it sounds really tiring. It's cool, though. I like it. I mean, at my current age, I have no kids. I have no family. So it's wonderful. I love it. Life's a constant adventure, going to different places, different influences. But my Lord. I, I know from my friends who have families, it can be a nightmare and drive people crazy. Or oh, to have a family? No, no, no. I know lots of divorced comedians because oh, yeah, yeah, very yeah. few people want to sit around and wait while you go touring. And if you have little kids at home saying, where's daddy? Daddy's making people laugh. Yeah. You know, well, I want to see daddy. You know what I mean? Like, I, so it's, it's like it's a, whole, it's a whole thing. But for me, I don't have any of those things uh, holding me back. So I'm, I'm having a blast. Yeah. So don't you miss having like a home or like somewhere regular to go to? No, but I never had one. So interestingly, I think part of why is that, so I was born, my dad was in exile from Malawi, Mm -hmm. right? And uh, we were in different countries. And then my dad worked for the UN, then we were in different countries for another. So I never had one place I stayed. So I think that's why I'm I'm happiest when I'm moving because I'm like a, a nomad. Yeah. That feels like home for you. Yeah. Like the movie. Yeah, pick a bit there. Pick a bit there. Wow. Yeah. Because I also, uh, I also read that you lived in Canada for a really long that time. That was university. Yeah. I went, yeah. To, I went there. So that was, uh, I was there six years, six years. So mm-hmm. I, I centrally uh, went there 99, did the uni. And then uh, that's, that's where I discovered comedy. Mm-hmm. Because they've got Just for Laughs, Just for Rire. And uh changed my life that finding that. Even mm-hmm. though I was studying something I didn't want to study, I was what did you angry. Study? Computer programming. My oh, family yeah. made me do it. So oh, yeah, yeah. I had got a scholarship to an arts university uh, in America. That's where I wanted to go. Mm-hmm. But my family was like, what are you doing? You can't study creativity. Go do something with a future. But at the same time, I discovered comedy only because I was in Canada. So it worked out. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. When, was the, when was the first time you saw comedy? So I had seen... St- I'd seen Eddie Murphy's um, Raw. Raw. Yeah, yeah. And Delirious. But I didn't know they were stand up comedy. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Because I just knew him as an actor. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, it's like a one man play, which he's doing. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know it was an actual thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then when I went to um, 
to 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 university, I went to a comedy club because mm. I was doing lots of open mics because I was like a poet and I was like a, oh, yeah. you know, write pretentious poetry and I'd do stories. But some of them were funny and people were like you're funny, you should go to this open mic. And it was a comedy open mic, and I went and did a funny rap. I didn't know you could do jokes, and I, when I watched people, I was my mind was blown. Because they were just talking, you know what I mean, about their lives. People were talking about sex. And I grew up pretty, like, conservative countries, even though I was traveling around. And it literally was, like, the best thing I'd ever experienced. When I did comedy and people were laughing, it, it was the best feeling. And I was like, I didn't even realize it. But that moment, I became a comedian. Because mm -hmm. it was, it, all the other stuff I wanted to do became secondary. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still love books and I want to write novels, right? But it's, like, in terms of enjoyment, comedy is my, mm -hmm. my it's my joy mm -hmm. i actually remember uh when i was a uh, when i was a teenager we used to go and visit my family in london a lot and they had like the sky tv you know like the i don't know yeah sky tv sky you, tv yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes 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 we, back back then like here in belgium we didn't have no no digital tv whatsoever <laughs> like we're we're always behind on stuff well you think, think that so when i was in kenya yeah um there was no, no television until five o'clock Right, and it would just run from five o'clock till midnight, right? Yeah. And the kids' programs were only from five to five thirty. So we would run home so yeah. we could watch that little cartoon or that little thing. Yeah. Because after that there was nothing. <laughs> okay. I guess. In some ways though, it's more healthy though, because I, yeah. I, I see like my nieces and nephews, like literally they have five hundred channels and they can scan between mm -hmm. SpongeBob and mm -hmm. whatever and it's just like abundance too much stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like while we really we had no choice but to play outside with each other because there was only thirty minutes of yeah, cartoons. Yeah, yeah. I feel that's like a thing of today, like having too much stuff to watch. Too much, There's way too, too much. much. I've stored <laughs> stuff. This is the thing I do now is I collect stuff I want to watch more than I actually watch stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I've got a hard drive with all sorts of stuff that I'm one day gonna watch, and I think it's usually like I'm on a long flight or something, and then I catch up. But then otherwise, I'm just storing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. Like I have a super long list. Yes. Of like series and books I, I, I want to read. You, I put you. I added <laughs> stuff to your list yes. just when I was yes. talking to you. I was. I just took a picture of this book. It might take five years for me to actually get to the book. It's also funny because when I was a kid, I, I think a lot of children. So much of my life was spent talking about boredom. Little kids are always bored. I'm bored. There's nothing to do. I'm bored. Yes. I haven't been bored in years. I would yes. love a day of boredom. Yes. I've got too much to do. Right. Like right now, I'm doing this podcast. I should be writing. I have three things due. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. The, I, I literally don't even know how, yeah. if I could have an extra three hours a day. Oh, yeah, right. That would be wonderful. It, um, apparently, boredom is actually good uh for your creativity as well there you go because actually it, yes i would actually say maybe i became creative to fight boredom because i always used to be bored as yeah, a kid and then i would tell myself stories yes. and make up things and yeah, it, it, it creates yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i heard uh the famous british comedian oh i'm, I'm forgetting his name he's really big i'm, I'm gonna physically or famous no no he's he's famous like okay, a, he's famous. Uh, yeah. mustache very old guy now I'm gonna Billy Connolly. No, I'm oh, gonna okay. remember yeah. his name later. You remember later. Uh, but he said that it's also a pity that um, people like because uh, we don't we have machines for everything. Yes. So we don't do the wash, you know, with the with the the whole the rack and like it, yes. it doesn't take four hours to wash. It does also like to uh, do doing the dishes. You just yes. Make, so there's no there's actually he said that uh, also there is a different kind of creativity that comes from doing manual labor yeah. yes actually i remember when i was in canada mm -hmm. right this is when i started our comedy i used to clean the comedy club right mm -hmm. because i couldn't get a job i couldn't get a job because i was a foreigner but i was able to get like just like a, a little job at the comedy club cleaning the floors and stacking the, sh the shelves with beer and stuff like that right mm -hmm. And so while I was doing that, my mind would be wondering and I would, I'd make up jokes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it does. It does give, give you some kind of because it has to be like a thing that you know to do with your hands. Yes. That's automatic. While your brain's doing other yes. things. And also it's got to be something you hate because you're trying to escape it. <laughs> and the one place I did not want to be was, oh, I still remember like uh, also during winter, yeah. there was an extra part of a job for an extra five Canadian dollars, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Was I also used to like get wood 
for the stove inside for to heat up the place. Yeah. And that was horrible because I'd have to walk across the icy lawn to the place where they stored the wood and then carry it back and I'd be freezing and I'd... Sl- oh, it was terrible. And when I look back, I was like, for five extra Canadian dollars, that's yeah. what that what I was doing? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. like, oh. I remember one of my student jobs that I had, I was working at a restaurant. Yes. But it was like a special pop-up exclusive restaurant. And the floor was like black, uh, glittery, shiny sand. What? And so I I was like the lowest in rank. And so I had to uh, brush the sand into shapes. Yes. But obviously it's sand. So one person walks over it and it's ruined. It's ruined but again. That was my job. Oh. So the the floor is not in a shape. So okay, <laughs> that was. That was I horrible. would whack whoever stepped on it. I'd be like, "This is you have no idea how much time I've met right. making it a perfect little star." Yeah, right. My heart shape. No. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So how are you liking Belgium so far? I'm loving it. I am loving it. I mean, like, I literally just came in yesterday, Mm -hmm. a very short time before the the show. And uh, so yesterday was pretty much just a show. Yeah. yeah. Uh, But today I hung out with a good friend of mine from Mm -hmm. uh, university. And uh, we've had loads of crazy adventures. You know, what's really interesting is when you meet people who you knew in our wild days. Do you know what I mean? Like when you were a student and your memories with them are like all night parties and (laughs) like people on drugs and people like scream like, and then you meet them and now they've got kids and the little dog and they're all domestic. And you're like, who are you? (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Like you were, you were the craziest person I knew. And I kind of like that meeting people in different phases of their life. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. you almost want to tell their kids, you have no idea. This person should never tell you not to do anything <laughs> because they did everything. Uh, I think it's also nice, no? Because it is nice. But it's because it's not just a different country, uh, not just a different uh, time in both of your yes. lives, but also a different country. Yes, different time, different country. That's also yeah. a cool thing. We meet in different countries. And mm-hmm. I, I kind of like that. I've got loads of pockets of friends in different countries. Mm-hmm. And so wherever I go, I've got people who I, I've got a friend I catch up with just every time I'm in Singapore. I've got the friend I catch up with every mm-hmm. time I'm in Zimbabwe. And it's mm-hmm. like, it's a it's a world which is only possible because of things like WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. things like yeah, yeah, Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it used to be you are just friends with your local community uh-huh. and everyone else disappears. But now, some of my closest friends are in a totally different country. It's wonderful. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Yeah. So, uh, so tell me how it is like to travel around as a comedian because I'm also I'm also a comedian, but also like a breaker. Yes. And, What's a breaker? Uh, uh, like a break dancer. Oh, like breaker. A, yeah, yeah. Breaker. What? Yes. And uh, uh, bust a move. <laughs> Later. <laughs> later, later, later! I did not know this. Awesome. Um, and um, so in hip hop, like, sorry, so I've got to ask: Do you incorporate it in your comedy? No, I don't. You gotta, you gotta. I gotta tell you, like everything you can do, you've got to find a reason to break it, to use it on stage. Okay. Like if I could break, I can tell you, I would have a whole routine which gave me an excuse to to, to break in the middle. Okay, my, you're actually like you're not the first one to tell me this. It's, it's so true. No, no, yeah. literally anything you can do. The great thing about comedy is there's no. No rules. single way to do it. There's no rule. Yeah, yeah. So if you're a person who sings, you find a way to sing. If you're a person who, like, whatever you are, you can put into it. Yeah. Okay. I'll try to do this. You'd also be the only person doing yeah, yeah, yeah. Breaking, breaking comedy. comedy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in the break scene, like, we really have a community sense, a community okay. feel. Like, if I would go to, say, like, Thailand, I would just put on my Facebook, yo, does anybody know any B-boys or B-girls in Thailand? And like, yeah. yeah. I'll hook you up and then, you know, they'll show us the city. They'll, you know, let us sleep there. Is it the same? It is like that too. It's still, well, look, it's it's like like that exactly exactly when you're starting out. Yeah. Right. So when you're starting out, literally you will go to a place on a coach, stay on a comedian you've never met before's couch. Yeah. And just kind of exist and do it but there's a level where you get a bit more professional yeah, yeah, yeah. where it would be a little bit odd uh-huh, like it'd uh-huh. be a little bit odd if i'm coming here and saying yo guys i, I i've been on television it would be odd if i'm yeah, like yeah, now yeah. crashing on your couch people be like what what are you doing yeah, 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 you yeah. cheapskate get a hotel room you know what i mean but no no there's definitely that community i'll tell you the other thing is this the place where you see it is when a comedian's in an accident or something like that. So uh, there's a comedian who had a stroke in England right now. 
and people band together, raise money for them. And it's when something negative happens is when you really see, because there's a lot of pettiness, there's a lot of competitiveness and cattiness, Mm -hmm. but whenever it's important, people uh, get together. Like I'm doing a charity for Malawi Mm because, you know, there were floods and cyclones. Mm -hmm. And I just messaged some of my famous comedian friends and it's amazing how they, they will say yes and help you Mm -hmm. when you need it um, for nothing. Mm -hmm. It's been awesome. So how has it been, like, because uh, you talked about competition just earlier, or yes. how has it been for you coming up in the comedy world? Like, the, do you see, because, like, if you take the two extremes, yes, like, you have the, the people that are really competitive and think that, oh, somebody else's success is, is bad for me. Yes. And then you have the, uh, the, the other extreme where there's people like, oh, I just love comedy and I just want everyone to do well. Where are you on that spectrum? Well, think? look, I love comedy. Like, mm-hmm. I love comedy. Well, I, I, you know, some people will not watch the other comedians. I watch all the comedians because yeah, I yeah. love comedy. Well, yes, there was an ex- exception because I didn't understand everyone, but I'm just, yeah. I just love watching comedy. I, I love consuming it. But at the same time, I have to fight against my own, um, not even competitiveness, my own like petty jealousy. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Because mm-hmm. literally, one of the reasons, one thing which I actually have to fight, it's like let's say you're, you're, you're coming across like you read that another comedian has got a big success, right? It should make you happy. Mm-hmm. But sometimes it can make you go, hey, I'm, I'm funnier than him. Why do you get it? I do get it. It's, it's a terrible, terrible impulse, which I think a lot of people have in them. And I had to get rid of it, yes. right, by focusing on what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Because a few years ago, so I don't feel that way now, but I've also had a bit more success now. But I would say like four years ago, I mm-hmm. used to have a lot of envy. I'd get very grumpy. And I realized it wasn't helping anything. So I was like, okay, I'll just focus on writing more Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you can spend a lot of time like i know people who complain all the time like oh look they always put that sort of person on television why don't i ever get it and i'm like you haven't written a new joke in three years Mm. right like why that person even if they might not be as creative as you or something they're working hard there's a reason they got the the thing and Mm -hmm. some people are like oh well they're they're good looking. They're only booked because they're good looking. And I'm like, well, you could go to the gym too. You know what I mean? Like, so it's, it's, it's easy to complain, but it's also like, well, if that's really a problem, can you mm-hmm. uh, do something to uh, try and uh, fight that? Is that also something that changes with age, you feel like? Or when you... Yes, it changes with age. Because I will say when I started, when I was like 20, I just wanted to perform. I was having a ball of a time. I didn't care about being able to pay my bills. I was happy to hide in the closet, hiding from the landlord. I didn't have massive ambition. In fact, there were big opportunities I kind of wasted when I look back at it. But so? so, so I went to Australia years ago and I got an offer from a very big agent and I just kind of felt loyal to my current agent. So I didn't go with them and it was a very dumb thing to do. But you know, it was one of those things where I wasn't hungry. Like now, I would you, you're looking for the opportunity. You're looking yeah. for how to maximize your career. My career was such a low priority. I was like, well, I'm having fun. I don't need to betray this person. I'm, I'm having. I, my, I was more about having fun than I was, uh, you know, a career or anything like yeah. that. And you get older, and you, you know, you you want a you want a house. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you want clothes that aren't secondhand. You yeah. you, you know. I th- think uh, you can't be bohemian forever. No. You know what I mean? It's cute when you're young. Yeah. But it's, there's a point. Yeah. Also, I mean, just in terms of ma- finding a mate, not that the opposite sex is shallow, but you will do much better if you are financially stable mm-hmm. than if you're like, okay, let's go for a date. Um, okay, this restaurant's really cheap. <laughs> like, <laughs> let's, let's go there. <laughs> You're like, oh, we, we need to go on holiday, but we'll backpack and we'll stay at a, a, a backpacker's hostel. Yeah, yeah. I think you'll do a bit better with the ladies if you like, oh, let's go on holiday. This is a lovely five-star hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're going to be at the beach on Mauritius. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Like, yeah, true, true, yeah. true, true. Yeah. Um, and so uh, tell me about... Um, I have to say, I, I saw your thing on uh, Britain's Got Talent. Yes. I mean, your thing, I don't mean to be... My uh, performance. Show. My show, yes, yes. yes. Um, uh, and uh, actually, I thought it's uh, I thought it very ballsy of you to enter Britain's Got Talent. Yes. Because to me, it seems, and I mean, it seems, maybe it's not so, yeah. so I'm going to ask you. Um, for me, it seems like a nightmare situation for a comedian. It 
often is. Yes. And it often was. But yes. at the time I did it, I had become frustrated with my career. I was doing the same gigs every year. Yeah. The same locations. You same, mean? same small shows. I couldn't get to the next level because I don't know how it is here, but there's almost like three levels in England. Yeah. There's uh, maybe probably four, but there's like open mics. Mm-hmm. Right, where you're not being paid, you're just trying to yes, make it right up. Yeah. Then there's like comedy clubs. Like yes. you're getting paid, you're not getting paid a lot, you're doing uh, uh, whatever. And then you you get to the next level, which is people who are touring. Yeah. I couldn't get to that level and I couldn't get to television, radio, whatever. And I'd auditioned for stuff. I'd done so many things trying to get to the next level. And I knew I was good because I always had great shows. The audiences were always great, but producers always had a problem or uh and i remember the last stories i auditioned for something and uh i got a a note back that oh we really love deliso but he clashes with someone else we've had on this season and i was like what do you mean clashes and what show was it or was it TV well show i don't really want to i don't no, it was no, a tv show but tv, I, show. TV okay. show i don't want to say which show it was no, but, right because i'm sure the producers changed now but but uh Essentially, they, he clashes with someone else who's been on. And I was like, what do you mean he clashes with someone else? And apparently, there'd been another African comedian. Well, not even a British black comedian called Fumbi, right? Who'd been on that season. So not even that episode. And the idea of having two black people in the same series was a problem. to them. And I got so frustrated. And I was like, I need to go audition for something where they don't care. And literally... The great thing about Rins Gontad, they can have 52 black people. They can have, they, they, there's no barrier. It's whoever comes and auditions, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I went because I was like, hey, they, they're not going to care that I'm too old. Because that's another thing you hear. It's like, oh, he's a little old. Because, you know, often like shows want the young, new, hip kind of person. And I'm like, shouldn't all that have matter be that we are funny? But, you know, TV yeah. has got all kinds of things of what they think the, the public wants. But I was like, these people don't care. You can be any age. You can be whatever. You come because they win if you're funny and they win if you're not funny. That's true. Because it's entertainment either yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So I was like, let me just give it a shot. And it went much better than I could have imagined. It was yeah. absolutely astonishing. It, it's changed everything because yeah. now I can tour. I've got a radio show. I've yeah. done more television. And it, it literally was a, a thing which I decided to do like, oh, let's see what happens. Like on a whim or? No, 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 whim. Oh, I thought about it because I considered doing it the year before. Didn't yeah, do it. And then in the next year, I was like, okay, let me give it a shot. Yeah. So I did think about it. So it wasn't a whim, but at the same time, my expectations were low. Yes, okay. I was like, I'm funny enough to not humiliate myself, mm-hmm. right? But all I thought is I'll get a nice video clip I could use to get corporate shows, right? Uh-huh. I don't know if they've got show. So it's like, yeah, you know, yeah, when you yeah. perform for a company... And uh, it pays quite well. Pays They're well, usually yeah. terrible shows. But, you know, having a TV clip is going to help. Yeah. So that's all I thought I was getting out of it. And then I got this golden buzzer thing. Yeah. And, um, and then I ended up in the finals. And it literally has changed, like, uh, what's possible. The other thing is, like, it's not guaranteed anything. But now I know I'm at the top of the pile as opposed to the... So if I, I wrote a sitcom, if I send it to the BBC, they're going to read mine first yes. as opposed to it be, being number 50. They yes. could still say no, but it just gives you that little push. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, because the, the thing that uh, I think... Uh, um, I, I uh, participated in uh, So You Think You Can Dance but quite a while oh, ago. Oh, hell yeah. Quite a while ago. Yeah. I didn't go far because I'm just a breaker. I'm not trained in anything else. But uh, I remember uh, uh, that I felt it was really hard for me to, uh, you know, let go or be myself in dance. Right. On that stage, because it's people are very, watching you and judging you. And it's you. very artificial. Yeah. It's very artificial. So. Did, did you feel, feel this? Did, did you feel that way when you? I didn't though, because I had a wonderful thing which happened to me, which I think changed everything for me. Is that my audition happened to be in a theater? Yeah. With um a thousand people watching. Yeah. Now, I'm a comedian. Yeah. I walk out. I see a crowd. I want to make that crowd laugh. Yeah, yeah. They, They happen to be judges and cameras, but I've got a thousand people. 
Yeah. If it was like the X Factor, where you know they audition in front of four people, I think I would have been terrible. But yeah. I was like, I've got this crowd to please. I totally forgot about the stress of the situation, yeah, and I was just yeah. like, let me make these people laugh. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it also helped that like my initial interaction with the judges was already funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I was like, oh, this is this is just fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And so uh, uh, that was last year. No, that was. Two years ago. Two years, two years ago. Yeah. Year and a half. But two years. Say two years. And you say that it brought you like to that next level. Next level. And, yeah. and how? Um, can you explain? Explain to us. Okay. What so means? let me say this way. Six years ago, I went on a tour in that I booked little theaters, and I put the poster out and I tried to fill it. And I was getting maybe forty people, fifty people, forty people. Last year, I did an 80-city tour. I was doing 1,000 people, 800 people, 1,000 wow. people, 600 people, 400 people. And so that's the difference. It's that now people pay to come see me, and it's like, um, it's it's a whole different... Now, I, I'm still at level three. Like, I'm not like, you know, these Kevin Hart's do arenas, right? Yeah. There's a whole other level. So mm -hmm. the, the thing is... The good thing about there's always a level above, yeah. right? And there are people like I do television rarely. There are people who are only do television. Mm -hmm. I'm still someone who does. I do small shows and I do my shows and I do a little bit of radio, a little bit of TV, and but still being on this level is so much higher than the level I was on, which was just little comedy clubs and pubs yeah. and like um, yeah, it's just been good. It's been very good. Wow. Also, like. Visas have always been a problem for me, like in terms of like, because I've got Malawi passports, the worst passport. Oh, yeah. it's, it's literally. So you have the Malawi uh, uh, identity? Uh, a pass yeah, yes. Uh, so you, you're yes. a citizen of Malawi. Of Malawi, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. getting visas while African, it can be very yeah. dramatic and mm -hmm. difficult. And ever since doing television, it has been much easier. Really? Yeah, inter I mean, like, I, I went for to renew my British visa one time, and the person who was going to do the the uh, decision asked me to, for a selfie for their kid, and I was like, I think I'm going to get this one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But at the same time, ironically, I had trouble with this Belgian one. But again, I'm like, I, maybe, maybe they didn't know who I was because yeah, yeah, usually, yeah. if if the the person opens, he's like, I know him. It's, it's, you're done. <laughs> I need to do Belgium's Got Talent, and then I'll, then I'll, yeah, yeah. Uh, then I'll come through easily here oh. too. And it's not that it's not that they're going to cheat yeah. because of it, but it's just if they recognize you, mm -hmm. the whole story needs no persuasion. Because usually it's like comedian. Is he really a comedian? Oh. Is he? You know what I mean? Can he sustain his life? But if they recognize you, like, oh yeah, I know this guy. He, yeah, he's, yeah. He's a, yeah, yeah. He's a he's real a thing. He's a real thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've seen him. Like, yeah, I've seen him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Wow. And so, so right now you say like eighty cities. Uh, your 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 show. Is that was the last, the last. The last tour did yeah. 80, 80 cities in the UK, but then it also oh, did some the, African. Okay. It also did some in Africa. Did so I did uh, I did South Africa, Malawi, um, and uh, Rwanda, right? So and then I also did Singapore. So I'll do others, but I'm just saying, uh, pr the. Europe, the UK leg of the tour did 80 different cities. Wow. Yeah. So, and how, I have to say, like, I don't know anything about the African, like, I mean, the separate countries, about the comedy scenes there. Go perform in Congo! Yeah? Yeah. My French is okay. I don't know if it's comedy ready. I can make... I Look. I've, uh, as I said, Eddie Caddy, Congolese comedian, yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. brilliant, yeah. Uh, performs there. It's, it's very different. different. Okay, the, there is comedy yeah, yeah. in African countries. The, every one country is a little different, but I would say most of them, it's more single big events. Okay. So they're not like monthly or weekly comedy clubs like we have in in some Western countries. It's more like um, maybe twice a year there'll be a big show. Right, they'll maybe have one famous person who they've flown in, like Basket Mouth or someone like that, mm -hmm. and there are five thousand people mm -hmm. and coming to watch. And it's a very, it's a much bigger kind of thing. But people love, people love comedy, mm -hmm. right? In fact, they get extra excited because it's so rare. Um, and the other thing is that you see everybody nowadays watches the same stuff on YouTube. 
right? Yeah. So be you going to Rwanda or going to Singapore, they've watched Chris Rock on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the difference is they when you write local stuff, it's such a treat for them because they've never had a comedian talking about them mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. And I think it's 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 really worth looking into, especially if it's part of your heritage. Yeah. Because they also will appreciate that part of it. Or even if you don't want to perform, go break dance. Go yeah, do yeah, something yeah. there because mm-hmm. uh, I, uh, at the same time, Congo's got issues. Congo's got some problems, right? But again, they you, you find you find you find people. Yeah. There's, there's 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 always room. I mean, I guess most of the time there's room for funniness, no? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Probably places which are struggling need it more. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going this summer for the first time, so... Awesome, awesome, yeah, awesome. I'm excited. Enjoy. Um, let me ask you about um, something different. Like, in the comedy scene, how how white is the English comedy scene? Well, you see, I perform all over the place, mm-hmm. right? So, yes, um, you know, in England, it is very white because it's a very white place, right? Mm-hmm. And I, so I would say... Um, do you mean the audience or do you mean the performers? Um, both of them. Like, maybe both of them. Start with, start okay. With the audience, maybe. So audiences, I would say that most crowds of, I perform to week to week are probably 90% white, mm-hmm. right? Maybe 80% white, depending mm-hmm. on where I am. If I'm in a big city, yeah. it's maybe 60%, mm-hmm. right? If I'm in London or Birmingham, but most of the time I'm in little towns where it's mostly white. Now, interestingly, there's a black circuit, which is like comedy clubs, which are for black audiences predominantly right okay. and but i don't do that circuit much okay um i can do it i've done it on occasion but that wasn't the route i went it's almost like a different style of comedy have you watched def jam yes that's actually the first comedy i saw ever. okay well the comedy in the black circuit in the uk for some reason is more like def jam comedy mm-hmm. and that's not my style mm-hmm. at all and i can shift it so i can still do it but i don't do it a lot mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. And then uh, in terms of comedians, mm-hmm. there are definitely, again, more white comedians. and uh, th- But there are loads of great black comedians in, in the UK. And if you look globally, mm-hmm. you'll actually realize that um, minority comedians overall are doing better. Because mm-hmm. if you look of think of your top three comedians right now. Mm-hmm. In terms of who do you think are the oh. most money making? Not necessarily your favorite. Oh, money making. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's Dave Chappelle, Kevin Hart. Black, black. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know I mean, it's it's like yeah, so, yeah. so so. There's no barrier to minorities globally mm-hmm. being a comedian, but I would say in the British context, there has been historically a lot of difficulty for ethnic people because again, it would be like, oh, we don't want more than one black person on the show, mm-hmm. and but. A lot of those viewpoints are changing. Mm-hmm. I would say that, again, like around uh, 20 years ago, you would never see... Hey, uh, how are you doing? <laughs> Hello again. How are you doing, man? RB, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Hello, RB. How are you doing? How are you doing? Uh, no. You're a little late. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just in time. You oh, were, well, you, you meant saying, to. Well, you I meant, meant to, yeah. Okay. I was entrance. talking about being funny while brown in, 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 in the UK. No, are no. You, are you black? No, I'm brown. Oh, okay. brown. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I will say that it it used to be an issue, and there's still clubs where it's an issue. Like there's some clubs in the UK where they'll never have two black people on, or they'll never have two women on in a lineup. In a lineup, because again, but again, as I said, it's changing. Okay. Yeah. When I first got to the UK, I would say almost all the clubs would never have two black people or two women on, because they almost felt like, oh, you know, it's not going to bring in an audience. But I think even there's a comedian uh, from London. We had him on Nafset, yeah. who has a joke about it. Yeah, probably. Yes. Oh, no, no. It's um, Ola. Ola, exactly. Yes, Ola, the comedian, exactly. has a great joke, and it's entirely true. But I'll tell you the interesting thing. I almost don't, even though it sounds like racism, I feel there's a different kind of racism which is based on economics, right? They didn't do it, not because they hated necessarily, but they thought, oh, it won't sell as many tickets. Mm-hmm. Right, and then as soon as they realize that, oh no, people will pay to see black people, then they don't care because it's not a moral decision; it's a financial situation. And it's the same reason with movies, right? You would see that, oh, there are no black ca- main characters, right? And then like Black Panther makes loads of money, and suddenly there's a black TV show about a superhero. There's another. And it's it's an economic thing. They're like, oh. There's money to be made there. Let's do it. And I think it's that thing of 
uh, as much as it seems like you're, it's it's like a racist thing, I'm like, no, no, no. It's like they don't think people will pay for it. As soon as they know people will pay for it, then you start getting it. So similarly, I have now proved that people will pay money for me. So those people who once would hesitate will say, oh, hire him. Yeah. Is that uh, something that you picked up on... Uh uh britain's got talent or what was the show called yes i did britain's got talent britain's and got... it uh no it definitely increased my audience it increased your audience but yeah. uh, did it also uh break up uh, your audience for like do you have new audiences the biggest the... difference with my audiences is just i have more little kids now <laughs> <laughs> that's oh. the the biggest change that's Isn't the that biggest change no, it's fine because like, so when I was going on tour, I was worrying about it because I was like, little kids are going to come. We're going to put 14 on the, the poster, but little 12 year olds and 11 year olds are going to. So what I actually did was I stacked my dirty jokes right in the last 15 minutes. The show is an hour and a half, right? So maybe around an hour, 10 minutes in, I would say to people, look, I know it says 14 and I know some of you have snuck in eight year olds and nine year olds. Now, I've not done any of the dirty stuff yet, but I would just say that if you snuck in a kid, the next 20 minutes is probably not for them. And then they would just take them out. And oh, and the kids still had at least an hour of entertainment. That's good. And I actually thought that was better than initially they were saying, oh, just tell the theaters to not let them in. And I'm like, no, it's a little kid. Show me on Brains Got Talent, wants to watch me. How can I have a problem yeah, with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? What, what, what kind, kind of jokes, jokes uh, should we think about? about? What was what's offensive? Oh, okay. For could you give an? Oh example? no! So the kid's favorite joke, which I did in Brains Got Talent. It's funny what kids like. Is I did a joke how the Bible says, "Thou shalt not steal." Nowhere does it say, "Thou shalt not swap." I don't know if it's because it's so simple or it's uh, kids love it. People all kids always come to you and they. they, they they, thou shalt not swap. They yeah. more than don't know my name. They just say thou shalt not swap with me. And it's funny because that's not the one. Adults uh-huh. focusing on the one where I did two hundred years ago. This would have been an auction. Yeah. That's what captures a lot of the adult imagination because exactly. about racism and stuff. But kids, it's that little simplicity. I'm taking something yeah. they're all told don't steal, don't steal, and I'm just playing with it. And that little kids love that. And um, kids are very enthusiastic audiences. So, but, but, that's but that's something we uh, we were talking about uh, the last time. It's uh, the comedy for kids is becoming very booming. It's now a part of the yeah. of the industry, the comedy yes. industry. Um, but you already have like a, a lot, or maybe a little bit uh, material that is child friendly. Does it does it make you an uh, an all round comedian? Well, I was never that dirty anyway. So okay. it's not even like I do specific material for kids, right? I just do my material minus some of the dirty stuff, right? And kids come along. And I think this makes sense because when I was a kid, I watched Eddie Murphy. Yeah. I didn't understand half of it, but the stuff I understood, I loved his stuff about the ice cream and the yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, uh, you got no ice cream. You got no, as a kid, I was like, ah! <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I didn't even know what welfare was, but I n- understood enough of it to laugh. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? exactly. And so I think also kids, the delivery makes you laugh. They, you know, yesterday in, in the show, which we did, it, uh, um, there was a little kid at the front, right? There was a little kid sitting oh, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was saying some outlandish stuff where I was like, the kid <laughs> cannot understand this. But the kid was laughing. And I don't know if they were laughing because everyone else's get laughing because this kid was maybe five or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I think kids just get caught up in the rhythm yeah, of yeah, their yeah. like, oh, yeah, everyone's yeah. laughing. Yeah. Ah! And, and they might never, not even yeah. be laughing at you. They're laughing at something. Is that yeah. a little bit uh, the, the secret of stand-up comedy? Uh, do something that everybody can relate to, even movements? Because the... I guess I don't know though. I don't know though because again, it's like it's not like I planned to do it. Mm-hmm. It's like I was. You you're telling something that you think's funny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think when you've been doing comedy long enough, you every time you perform, you're you're doing something to make it funnier, and you don't know. Maybe it's your face does something. Maybe you're okay. whatever, and you gradually make the joke this perfect level that people that don't fully understand everything get caught up in it but again it's it's, i I think it's hard to control Mm -hmm. like you can't sit down and say i'm gonna write something universal 
okay? Mm -hmm. Because you'll write something terrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've got to write, this is what I think is funny. Okay. And then you find out whether you're universal or not. Like one of the f the funniest comedians I know is, is a guy called Gary Delaney. He writes some of the best oh, yeah, jokes yeah. you will ever hear. He's a is it with the genius. Abbreviations? No, no, no. no he, that's does Gary he does okay, puns. He does puns. He does really, really, and just really short one lines. Brilliant. But he's not for everyone. It's okay. really, really, uh, it's really clever and also really offensive sometimes. So it's not for everyone. But he's brilliant. And he just writes what he thinks funny, wow. right? While similarly, there are other people like Michael McIntyre who, again, just try to write what he thinks is funny, and it happens to be universal, and yeah, everyone loves yeah, it. Yeah. So I think you can't control your audience. You can just control, you can do the best version of what you do. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm just kind of lucky that a lot of what I do is kind of universal. Yeah. But there are a lot of people who hate me. I mean, I get loads of messages online, like, you know, like, you know. You, uh, you told us yesterday on stage that yeah. that you get a lot. Of... Oh, yeah. Is it, is but that's the nature of reality television. If you do, oh, yeah. um, I would say, I have friends who've done comedy programs like Live at the Apollo. Mm -hmm. And they haven't gotten nearly as much hate mail as I've got. Because the nature of reality television is, I don't know, it's like, it's inviting everyone to have a co an opinion. I mean, yeah. literally, they saw me on a competition, mm -hmm. right? Oh, right. And also, they get they hate you in a different way because if I'm watching a comedy show and I don't think this guy's funny, I'm like, he's not funny. But imagine I've been watching this competition and I really wanted this pianist or this singer to come through, and they got ejected for this unfunny mm -hmm. bastard. Mm -hmm. I gotta tell him that you you're not funny. You how dare you, right? Yeah. yeah or let's yeah. say. There was someone British, again, someone okay. British, lovely British ballet dancer they wanted to go through. And this foreign bastard goes through, <laughs> ah! and that's where it comes from. I mean, like, I, some of them are just racist idiots, but a lot of it is I knocked out someone they like, and then they're and like, yeah! So just, there's a whole other yeah, level of hate you get. Because I, I, I see you going off camera, Sue going like, a, <laughs> so, uh, have you also got experience about because you're um if i'm correct you're working on the tv program right now huh? yes I am, yes. I am. yes so are you ready for uh, the backlash of <laughs> oh actually i have to say i'm pretty i'm pretty emotional and pretty uh i don't know i do think i have thick skin in in some like sometimes most of the time yeah. but like, i also wanted to ask you does it impact did, did these messages impact your I'll tell you what impacted me. So actually, the messages I got in Britain's Got Talent, I didn't care. I was like, guys, I know I'm funny. Enough people think I'm funny. I don't <laughs> care. You you're just... funny. That's the, 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 <laughs> as a comedian, you have three comedians. Oh my God, somebody told you you're actually No, funny. but you are told you're funny every night you perform yeah. Yeah. by every person in the room. Yeah. Right? So that I have no insecurity about. But what frustrated me is that um, is politics. So essentially... Since I got like a bigger platform, sometimes I'll get called to come and be on a panel and discuss some issue, right? Usually a black issue, right? So either someone has done a racist tweet or Liam Neeson has said something or whatever. <laughs> And then, the Liam Neeson expert. They will call, they'll be like, oh, we need someone black. Because they don't want to be like white people on a panel. Just, Get someone black. Okay, who's, okay, that guy, that guy, that comedian. So I'll come on sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that, I will express my opinion. And mm -hmm. what, that's when you get like bizarre backlash. There was a time I got backlash by racists and by woke black people for the same statement. <laughs> I was like, how can I piss off both of you at the same time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I don't know if you know about this Lord Sugar, right? Who's like a... Uh, uh, the, yeah, he's yes. like the apprentice. The apprentice. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, so he's like a businessman. He, he did a tweet about the Senegalese team, like a funny tweet that some people perceived as racist. And I was called on a show to discuss whether it was uh, racist or not. And I was told, and to me, I'm a comedian. Like, nothing offends you after a while. You literally work with comedians who do jokes about, you know, like Auschwitz and stuff like that. They're literally comedians who write jokes about the most unspeakable stuff. When I was in Rwanda, there was a comedian who does a whole long routine about genocide. It takes a lot to offend a comedian, right? Exactly, yeah. And... So me asked about this silly tweet 
right? And I'm like, do I find that offensive? I was like, no, it's not offensive. Maybe it's not funny, but I'm not offended in the least, right? Yeah. Uh, are you offended as a comedian being like, this is a shit joke? No, again, you're not offended. You just move on. To me, it, it was a non-issue. Okay. Oh, my Lord. So the next day, but also in, I gave an example. So I said, look, this doesn't bother me. Like the other example I gave is, you may have heard there's an American woman called Roseanne who she yeah, she did a tweet. Oh, Roseanne Barr. She, she, had a sister. Uh, yeah, yeah, she yeah. lost her job because mm-hmm. of her racist tweet. And I said, like, wait a second. So we have entertainers like Roseanne Barr does a racist tweet, still got a job, mm-hmm. but their policemen, white policemen who shot black people still got a job, right? So that part of the my um, statement upset all the racist people. And they were messaging me like, oh, whatever those... And then at the same time, me saying that I wasn't offended by Lord Sugar thing, got other people saying, you Uncle Tom in the pocket of the white man. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. How can I both be like a race traitor and the black person pissing off these... At the same time. And so I just think it's funny that people, you can enrage both sides at the same time with the same statement. Is that but one of I, your goals? I do have to say, no, I just say what I think. I do have to say that in comedy, it's hard for me to get offended by anything. Uh, yeah. But in comedy, that's for me, that's the hard but part. But it's also because in comedy, because you know outside, the intent. Yes. Is that they're trying to, to be laugh. funny. Yeah. But outside of comedy, and that's where the, you know, the, 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 the board or the line is really thin because outside of comedy, I feel like people shouldn't just say anything they want. And then on in a tweet, that's hard because... I'm a comedian, but it's not up to me to decide what's comedy, or what's jokes, and what. what, what are I not actually, jokes? I say quite the opposite. I actually think that everywhere people should say what they want, but then they need to live with the response. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think if I am here and you decided to go on a racist rant or something like that, right? That's your freedom to do it. But then I also have the freedom to say you are an absolute idiot. That's total nonsense, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The only time when I think you need some interference is when there's a power there's a power structure which would make me unable to answer back, mm-hmm. right? So if we are all equals, I think you should be able to say everything, right? But if you are my boss, you can't necessarily make the same jokes that... A colleague would because there's this power relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I feel like, I do feel like in today's uh, Western, I mean, I can speak for Belgium. Yeah. Like in our society, if we were all equal, yes, then it wouldn't be a problem for everyone to just to say what they want. But there's no, like, there's no equality. Yes. There's racial. There's no, no, no. But I would well. say that, that, look, I would rather live in a world where people can say everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if sometimes people say unacceptable things, then where people react against... Because the thing which really pisses me off right now, which is there's a big move towards non-platforming people. So saying this person has views we don't appreciate, so we're not going to let them be heard. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, uh, yeah. which you spoke about. Yeah. And I'm like, this is not... The, the best thing is to listen to these people, people but argue with the stuff they read. read. They, they said, said yeah. like, I read Mein Kampf. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've read. You've got to read toxic stuff to understand the logic and pull it apart. And the idea of we need to get rid of everything that's negative, mm-hmm. I think, is very dangerous because, again, you've got to understand what in it is inspiring young, impressionable people to accept these views. And if you just ban it and don't read it, then you can't counter argue, mm-hmm. ar- ar- argue against it. And similarly, like, you know, when there's like, uh, there's this Milo guy, you know, Milo, this, um, we anyway, this guy, called Milo, we well, Milo, anyway, there's a, the, there's a guy, I, I, I don't know, is mine, Marian Tonopolis or something like that. And mm-hmm. he says very questionable stuff. And so a lot of countries ban him from coming in and speaking. And I'm like, no, 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 you let those people speak. But, but then, then you answer, answer and, and then you put in a counter narrative and then people can make their minds up as opposed mm-hmm. to just so, so I, I, I I'm very much for say everything. But again, I, I'm I don't want to generalize because there are situations where I fully agree. Like so for example, if you find out that there's a someone coming to speak to little children at a primary school that has some views which you're 
you're, you're not, not necessarily you, you don't, don't really want an 11 year old to, to be exposed to these views okay. it's, it's not a why not because, because it's not the same as like an older kid where there's nuance and, and they can start how old do you need to be then uh, for do you then have to know every situation okay this is where we so how do because you know, i think I think it's a, if, if you're a school, you're caring, you're caring what the parents, parents think. Okay. Right? Yeah. And it's, it's going to be very... If parents don't want their kids exposed to some person's racist views or sexist views or something like that, mm -hmm. I think you've got to give it to them mm -hmm. because at that age, you've got more of a say. I think, yeah, yeah. I think as they get to their teens... That's, that's when they start, start making their own decision. That's, that's when they start. That's, that's when they should be exposed to everything, and then they can choose where they lie. But again, there's no fixed number. Okay. It's. I think it's a, a thing which you decide together. But For all I meant is young versus old. Okay. Is it also something that you see in uh, stand-up comedy these days that that there's a uh, a difference between crowds or your opinion because you have one you said you have one opinion but is it always the same opinion with every crowd or do you need to have like a, a flexible opinion i think no i think you, well i can speak for myself i will always express my opinion and i always say what i believe but i think the order in which i do it might be different okay. so for example if i'm in the uk the uk mm -hmm. and i want to talk about uh my sexual relationship with my girlfriend and something that's frustrating me about it. I could literally open on it, okay. right? Yeah. But let's say I'm in Malawi, which is a bit more conservative. I'm not going to not say those things, but what I will do is I'll warm them up. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about some other subjects that they understand and that they agree with, and then I'll gradually ease them into this subject matter, which is a little bit more difficult for them, or they might... I'll give you a perfect example. So Malawi has got a lot of homophobia, mm -hmm. right? And there was a time where they arrested... I don't know what I did. I did like... No, no, but there was, a, there was literally a time when they arrested two gay people for being gay. Well, for getting married, because it was a And I wanted to talk about it, but I knew this was very divisive for people in the room right, right? But, but i still wanted to talk about it so the, the way i got into the story was very uh I almost sneakily in okay. that i started talking about something and they didn't know i was talking about that and they agreed with me and then i started talking about something else which was parallel and again they agreed with me and then when i bring up this final subject they've already been Agree, agree, and, and so, so that so, so it's that, that thing, thing of you've got to change how you approach stuff if you know people might have it. Like people always ask me, like there's a racist group uh, in England, right? They said, "Well, would you do a gig for them?" I said, "Hell yeah, yeah. I'd love to do a gig for them." The point is, would they listen to me? But if they were going to, if they were like strapped to their seats and weren't going to leave, I would love to talk to them, and I would try to get to them. So I would start with opening on something like you know that i think they'll agree with and then i'll gradually try Did you to think about an opening joke yeah this i'll be like hey what would you, would your no 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 I, my opening joke would be like i know you guys hate immigrants i'm an immigrant i'll be honest i hate you guys too or something like that you know what i mean and then you're know, like or, or, or like or, or i hate I hate foreigners too. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, I don't know necessarily, but you find a way in, or you exactly. talk about love, yeah. or, or or you talk about whatever, and it would be like, you know, I wouldn't be happy if, yeah. you know, <laughs> I wouldn't open with uh, brown people. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Something, and then and then you, but then you you challenge them, and you often will have. I've had cases where someone, I did a show in Newcastle, and afterwards this guy came to the show and said, you know what, when when you went on. It's funny. It was also hard to know how to respond. But when you went on, I saw you were a black lad. I thought I'd hate it, but you know what? It was really funny, and I was like, okay, okay. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Like, so people, humor, humor does help. Humor can get you to think about stuff you do you wouldn't think about. Do you feel responsible to ever to, no. to better the world? No, no, no. I think it happens just by accident. Like somebody. Uh -huh. uh, told me not again this is their theory mm -hmm. but i thought it was very interesting what they said so you know in america there have been a lot of like gay marriage legalized and stuff yeah, like that yeah. and it used to be hyper conservative you couldn't imagine this 20 years ago and he said a very interesting thing he says he thinks the two things that combined most to make this possible was will and grace and ellen DeGeneres, right because laughter 
yeah. is yeah. often yeah. one of the ways that people can yeah. interact with what they th- they hate and slowly start changing their mind. Now, again, we have no statistics. This was just a theory. Yeah, yeah. But to me, it sounded possible. It sounds plausible. It's because I know people who hate a certain group, but they'll listen to music by someone. By, and yeah. you're like, you know that person singing that lives in a way you do not approve of. And like, yeah, but I like the tunes, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting. I think... Um, Humor has a lot of power. It, it can't start a revolution. But it's not but something... But it can comment. It can, but you can't control it. You can't control it, but is it... Uh, for example, I, I don't know if uh, Sue agrees uh, with me. Uh, there's a, a pressure on new acts, new kind of comedians. Um, if, it's, if they're gay or from a minority, to be, to be funny and by being funny almost emancipating the group where you're yes. from do you feel the pressure to uh, as a um yeah um as a as a what, what group are you as a, as a, a minority I'm a woman. yeah a woman exactly in comedy, like, wow. in com- like okay in right 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 comedy, right, right. Like there's, there's ask her how many female uh, comedians female yeah. comedians are in flanders <laughs> she, she, has she has to think yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. there's okay. there's some coming up like on the right camera, right yeah. and they're, they're really good but uh, yeah uh, I would say, like, professionally, there's just me. Okay. You? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, no, actually, yeah, I do get asked a lot of questions. You know, I always get asked, you know, why don't more women do stand-up comedy? And why don't, and yeah. why don't, and how come? And, and they always ask me about my heritage as well, because, as you know, like, uh, like uh, comedians, like minority comedians, there's yeah. also just a few of us in Belgium. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Do you feel the pressure for... To be know. like a role model or like a, role role, like a representative. Yeah, to, to speak, speak about your uh, side no, of the story. I just, or, no. I just talk about, like on stage right now, I just talk about my life. And obviously that has those aspects in yes. it. Because they're part of yes. my life. And it's just right now, it's my theory that I don't want to be a comedian right now. I might change. Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't want to be like... Oh, oh, this, this about, about society sucks, sucks and that about society. I mean, I, mean, I do, do have an opinion. Like, yeah. I could talk about it. It'll this come up at some yeah. point, but yeah. Yes. But, but right, right now, I just want to talk about my life. life. And then, and obviously, so I'll talk about, like, I have this one joke about, um, I don't know how you say this in English. Uh, it's re- it's like an operation where you, you know, you, you get operated on your vagina to make it, like, younger. Oh, yes, I know this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, Rejuvenation. Yes, rejuvenation. I have a joke about this. It's really silly. It's about how I talk, like, don't, don't touch, touch it because, it because you know, there's bone on it, like, the, whatever, whatever, like, it's, it's a silly, silly, silly joke, but actually, actually with that joke, I want to say, like, you know, you know, you, you know, ask a lot of us women to look good every day. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Do we have to look, do do we have to look good in there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? So yeah. That, so I just talk about this, oh, I heard about this silly thing called rejuvenation, blah, blah, blah. I talk about that, but I don't go... You know, it's really hard as a woman to live up to the beauty standards because that's that's a sentence and that's a narrative that everyone's heard a million times before. Also, the problem is as a comedian, you've got to be being funny. Yes, exactly. And if you just make exactly. a political point yeah. without the jokes, then it doesn't necessarily... The other thing is exactly. I always so feel opinion. like in a weird way, me performing is already a statement. Right? right? Yes. What so I don't need to talk about, yes, exactly. I don't need to be talking about black issues. Yeah. Right? Now, I will once in a while, but I could be talking about dolphins. Right? But to some little kid who's rarely seen a black person on television, that's still a comment in itself. Right? And I actually feel like what I used to hate is like when I started out, right? I would, I remember the first little exposure I got was in Canada. And And I I went and they filmed me for around 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I I talked about about love. I talked talked about my family. And I talked about about race for two minutes. They They aired the two minutes about race and nothing else. Right? And And you you start start to realize that. that, So you you just start start doing doing that more more so that they air you. Yeah. Now that I've got a little bit of an exposure, I can do a sh- I can talk about everything. I can talk about love. I can talk about whatever. And I actually think that we need to get to the point where you can be a minority talking about things which have nothing to do with that minority you're part of. That's when it's really liberated. Do you know what I mean? Like because if you are a gay comedian and every joke you tell has to be about being gay, or if you're black and every joke has to be about being black. 
And you're not in control of this. People always say, oh, you know, these minorities, they just bang on about being a minority. And I'm like, you try to get booked by these people mm -hmm. who are trying to tick boxes. They're going to get the most gay person or the most black person who only talks about that. But once you get, but it's almost like sometimes there's a first album, second album thing, right? Oh, okay. So your first album, you give them exactly what they want, right? Okay. Literally, I can be angry black man for hire if that's what gets me the money, right? That yeah, gets yeah, me the grant, yeah, yeah. right? And I will do that, make people laugh with that. And then maybe my next show will be about, you know, my girlfriend. Have nothing to do with race. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I know to... I, you've got to not be an idealist. You've also got to be practical. You've got to be like in Malawi, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to be a performer, you need to get money from these gov non-governmental organizations. If you want that money, write jokes or, or write a song about AIDS, write a song about violence against women, Okay. write those things that these people, these UN people want to hear. They'll give you the money. And then you can do what you want. And if you're someone who's like, oh, I don't want, I just want to write from my soul. I'm like, you can, but you're not going to get that grant. Yeah, right. Yeah. So there's a level of you've got to, you've got to be a practical person as well as being an idealistic. And the idealist in me just wants to be creative and say what I think is most funny. But the practical part of me will always think like, okay, what does the market want? How do you develop, yeah. develop can I, that? Can I, yeah, yeah, can I add something as well? Yeah. Uh, when I first uh, started out, I've been doing comedy now for six and a half years. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Um, we so, need like an, uh, a digital effect now. With yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I, I remember when I, f uh, like three years ago, but also before, I used to get like commentaries from um, uh, recent centers or like uh, people who write reviews. Yes. Reviewers. Yeah. Reviewers, but also like some older, older comedi comedians like, like telling, telling me like, like, like not to my face but like in in newspaper, newspaper articles and like on radio like why doesn't she talk, why doesn't she talk about her race more you know she's a woman you know she's black mm -hmm. she should talk about this more why doesn't she talk about her yeah. african heritage what is it yeah. and i felt like these people thought that like one of these guys they thinks he's really progressive and thinks like oh yeah and comedians should talk about societal issues all the time i'm black so i should talk about societal issues that are you know have to do with race all the time but i feel like you're doing the same thing that uh that like really racist people is you're restricting me yes. in my identity and I'll tell you, i can be whoever i want exactly. and what's ironic is if that was all you did talk about they would say yes. she's only successful because yeah. she talks exactly. about it and like what what, what the exactly yeah. but i do i do agree with what you say you have to be practical as well because sometimes you know i come in these villages and i i, I perform it's like a very wide room yeah. uh, not necessarily a bad thing but it's just i have to adjust yeah i have to talk about the fact that i'm black first first just for, for so, just so that they can get exactly. this. Exactly. It's like an elephant in the room. It's exactly. like, but, but it's, it's like exactly. if someone morbidly obese walks on stage yeah, yeah, yeah. and they don't, don't mention it. Exactly. Yeah. They, they've got to address it just because it'll be a, people want to say something. Do you know what I mean? Or like, if you look exactly like some famous person, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You've got to address it because yeah. they're thinking it. Like if there's a comedian who's got little glasses and whatever, and he always opens by saying. I know Harry Potter, whatever. But, but because people are thinking it and he knows he's got to address it. And I just think you've got to, again, you can mine humor from when you walk on stage, you know what they see. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I even think that the path of a lot of comedy shows is when you walk on stage, they see everything's different, everything about you that's different from them. By the time you leave the stage, they've realized everything about you that's similar to them. Yeah. Right, and I think that's the arc often. Yeah, yeah nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's nicely put. Yeah. There's a, I was just wondering. Uh, the, okay, that's being uh, a performer. But what? Uh, how is it when you're still developing your own voice? Because mm -hmm. like Sue, I have same exactly the same thing. Uh, all the comedians or uh, other comedians just going from yeah, you you need to stop talking about race or and the thing is I've, I've tried very hard not to talk about specific race stuff general I think talk about, no no but I actually think they're talking nonsense I think all of us 
you've got to write about the stuff that's most on your mind. Yes. Yeah. So if you happen to be having a year where race is on your mind. Yeah. So like this year, I've been opening the newspaper. Ah, oh, what did Liam Neeson do? Ah, oh, what did... So my, my show has a lot about that, right? But the year when I had just been broken up with, that year I did a show called Love Sucks, which was just about loneliness. So if right now it's on your mind, mm -hmm. Then that's all you should talk about, yeah. right? Let True. them write about the other subjects, yeah. and I'm like, we should all just write about what is occupying your mind the most. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like also, like um, you, uh, my show is also a lot about these people getting blacklisted because mm -hmm. of the 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 like um, just the way that society is dealing with like the Me Too movement and yeah. stuff like that, mm -hmm. I find that very interesting. And it's something that I'm talking to people a lot. So I was like, I'm going to write jokes about it. And I remember my agent, well, one of my agents was like, well, you know, are you sure you want to step into that? It could, but I'm like, I'm yeah. not going to, I'm not going to, I don't think I have horrible views. So I'm just going to say what I think mm -hmm. in a careful way. And I think, and it's got some really good jokes come out of it. But it's like, if it's on your mind, you should probably try to talk about it. But exactly, but, uh, because, because that, that was, was also, also my point. point. There, there was, was a, a period of my time that I really, really tried to write material for the other person yeah. looking at me from the outside. Yes. And, and then still coming off stage, people go like, uh, oh, that was very ethnical. That was very... Mm -hmm. And it's just how yeah. the people did just see me with a beard or I don't know. Exactly. What they, what they see, but they go like, oh, that was... That was some ethnical stuff, mm -hmm. and I didn't. <laughs> yeah, but also so. they're gonna think that anyway. Yeah, they're gonna exactly. think that anyway. Yeah. I mean, like literal. Like there's a comedian I I really got irritated by him because um, I did a show called What the African Said. What the right? African Said. Yeah, and he said something like, "Oh, of course you put Africa in your title." Blah blah blah, banging on about Africa. And I was like, there was one joke in the entire show about africa i just happened to be an african doing the show exactly. so it was called what the african said because it was based on someone writing online in an article who was shocked by me said can you believe what the african said and i thought that was just an interesting kind of interesting thing to, to then call the title and the show was actually about um like people being shocked by something I said and what happened next. But it doesn't matter. In their head, they're like, oh, there you go, banging on about Africa again. And I was like, there were no African jokes in the show. Exactly. And there's no, like, you know, like in comedy, you should avoid just banging on about stuff. Yeah. That's exactly what comedy is about. Like, it's about laughter. It's incredible. But the good thing about comedy, which I will say is there, which isn't there in art, in, in other arts, like a, a play or like if you're watching an orchestra is, they, they can't, can't fake, fake it that they enjoy it or not. Yeah. Right? You, you could watch, watch a play and afterwards people say, oh, interesting, and they hated it. But stand up, if they weren't laughing, you know. Yeah. And, and so, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a I love it. It's a very kind of democratic kind of art because there is no point where I can be having a good gig and not know it, and there's no time I could be doing badly and not know it. You know every moment. Exactly. Yeah. You're it's very own. real. Yeah. yeah. That's what I love about I think like comedy is we we were talking about the children earlier, like comedy is kind of it's like with children. Like children are only honest. I mean yes. the really young ones. Yes. They're only oh, yeah. honest. If yeah. they think you wear ugly shoes, they will tell you. Tell Your me. shoes are yeah, ugly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. which I love about kids. Yeah. And it's the same with comedy. It's very honest. Like there's no people won't laugh. Like, for an hour and a half, just because they like you a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if they like you, like, some of, some of my friends have come up to me, like, sorry, I just, I'm, I haven't laughed. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it's fine. It's okay. Exactly. And also, it's not the end of the world if people don't laugh. No. I think a lot of, uh, that's the other thing. It's like, I will go into a subject which might not make the crowd laugh, because I know the next joke probably will. And I think you've got to be able to talk about the things which not everyone agrees with. And some people are little. I had a lady come to me after a show and she was like, oh, you know, I like the show. But, you know, you did those jokes about slavery and it really made me uncomfortable. It made me really sad. And, and I, I said to her, you know, that's what art's meant to do. It's meant to get a, 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 an emotional reaction. You don't have to be happy during the entire show. It's good that it made you feel that way. And she was a little taken aback. And I was like, yeah, it's fine. 
You need True. to feel every emotion. Mm -hmm. Don't yeah. worry, it's a comedy show, but it can take you to all sorts of places. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I, she, I necessarily convinced her, but I just that's what I feel. And so it's okay to have all kinds of other emotions mm -hmm. on your way mm -hmm. to, to... I mean, like, there was that show which a lot of comedians were discussing last year called Nanette. I don't know if you want oh, to Oh, yeah, uh, Hannah Gatsby. Yeah. yeah, and some people were... Some people took issue because it's not funny for the entire show. But I'm like... Where in the rule book does it say a comedy show has to be funny for the entire show? It's funny at the beginning. It's funny at certain points at the end. And it takes you on a journey. And I think if comedy is a journey, then I can have a five-minute chunk in my set where I don't make you laugh because I am building you to a big laugh at minute six. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What's, the, what's the, the part of the journey that you don't like? If uh, if comedy is a journey, is there a part that you don't like? Um, or some of the industry industry stuff. You know what I mean? Like it's going to auditions is frustrating. Okay. Uh, Why? Like auditions, like for TV, because auditions, like here in Belgium, we don't. No, yeah, many, many TV. For TV, for TV, okay. TV stuff. Um, because again, you you're just talking to someone who's judging you. And, you know what I mean? And um, also like there's a lot of there's a lot of um, a lot of judging going on. The in I don't know how it is here, but the industry often, especially when people are starting out, is very bad in terms of like paying comedians. Like sometimes they'll delay it a lot, and you're like, wait a second, it's a comedy club. It only exists because of comedy. Shouldn't it be your priority to pay these people because you know they're paying for the beer? Right, you know they're paying. Well. So there's some clubs. There was a club which you know ended up comedians took it to court because it took them months, and then there were people who weren't paid. And it's just one of those things where, like, there's a taking comedians and artists for granted, which it happens in music. It happens that part's frustrating sometimes. But of course, once you get to a certain level, then it's the opposite. They'll, they'll, they, I can guarantee you, they paid Chris Rock immediately. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I. I I, it's, so some of that is a little bit frustrating, but it's nothing to do with the actual stage. Okay. Like being on stage, the performance is great, but some of the industry stuff I find frustrating. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. What about you, uh, like, um, What part oof. of the journey? Don't yeah, I think it's, it's also, also a part, part of the industry. industry. The thing is that we have, um, because of the UK and also yeah. the US, we have a lot of stories about stand-up comedy coming our way. Uh, for example, uh, how comedians like Richard Pryor evolved yeah. and being, and there's a lot of knowledge to be learned from other yes. people. But um, the most frust frustrating thing is being based in Belgium oh. is that it's a completely different universe. It's not. Uh, it's not something that. For example, we if if you're a very good comedian, a uh, very uh, good open micer you could drive around uh, Flanders, uh, Flanders and you could perform two times, maybe three times a week. Yeah. Yeah. If you really See push it. Yeah. That's a lot really though. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a lot. But if you take it with you with the development and the way how we uh, uh, help each other or uh, uh, inspire each other, it's very difficult because yeah. you you have to juggle between uh, a lineup show being in a comedy yeah. club, so that's a different kind of uh, set that you perform. Then you will open sometimes for somebody for a big yeah. name. It's totally different. Yeah, totally, totally different. different. And then the open mic is more of a showcase vibe that you go that you and that people uh, that pay a couple of euros to see you really are looking at an uh, uh, an open micer as okay uh i want to uh, laugh i want to really get my money's worth and that's a difficult thing well where you are affects everything i mean part of the reason i live in england mm -hmm. is interesting because if i lived somewhere like malawi mm -hmm. i would probably make more okay right because I am the, the only Malawian comedian, comedian of any acclaim, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I like, I've, I've inspired, inspired a few people, but I mean, literally, like, I'm the only one. one. Okay. But right. if I lived, lived there, there which again, a lot of like, like people, people who are like, telling me to think practically, I would like, 
I would have to be a businessman more than a comedian. Okay. Because I would be setting up the gigs. I would be doing that. And I'll do one once a year, but I would have to shift how I do it. And also, I'd probably make a lot of money, but I would be doing corporate shows. I would be doing advert for toothpaste. I would yeah. be like, and I was like, I want to tell jokes. Yeah. Yeah. I would gig a lot less. Like I've got a friend in Uganda, very funny guy, and he probably does three shows a month. But each, each of them, them pay him a bonkers amount. Yeah. And that would be my life. And I was like, th- that's not what I want for my life. You know what I mean? That's, like, wow. they're, they're, we've, got, we've yeah. got consideration. Now, look, if I was starving, that would be different. Okay. Right? That, but I think once you get to okay, mm-hmm. then you've got different priorities yeah. other yeah. than how much you're being paid. Yeah. Right? And I'm being paid enough that I'm living how I want to live. So why would I go somewhere where I make more, but I'm not having as much fun? Yeah. Mm-hmm. True. True. How oh, is it with you, Sue? If you I had a wife, wife and kids, kids, might be different because they'd be like, "Go to the hey, The kids are just, just screaming. Ah, oh, we're hungry. Yeah. Yeah. I want to buy this new bag. Yeah. 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 Uh, but for me, uh, yeah. uh, what do you mean, like financially or? or no, 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 I mean like, uh, uh, are you hungry? You can be also hungry about. Uh, well, uh, what's your re- relationship with? Uh, with performing every week or do you want oh. to perform every week or yes i love it actually okay. i mean i guess we all love it yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. if i could i would if perform I, every day yeah okay well every day for me uh i have to say maybe it's also like uh, in terms of like experience because yeah. you know but for me i remember when i first started out and i was just doing open mics and then uh that if i would play three times in one week the third time i would be like you know, like so tired yeah. from like 15 <laughs> minutes or 10 minutes. Yeah. Well, that's the other difference just, now is that I don't like short sets anymore. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So like yesterday I did, what, 30 minutes or something, something like, like that? that yeah. And I got to admit, like, I'm like, oh, that's like a teaser. Because now I've been on tour doing 90 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, I like doing the full spectrum the full experience. like but i understand you can't yeah. do that everywhere right yeah. but it's like it's now i'm realizing that oh once you've started doing it's like i'm no longer a sprinter i'm now a long distance comedian so when i have to do a sprint i almost am like oh it's fine but wouldn't it be great if i could do the full yeah but i love i love performing actually i still like uh short sets I've, i'm i'm doing a show as well like a, an hour and an hour and 15 minutes i guess yeah, yeah. and uh i enjoy that but i have to say for me still it's like a marathon it's like a marathon it's like, a marathon, okay. it's cl- like at the end i'm like you know my head is hot you know like people like try to talk to me afterwards i'm like yeah yeah like all my vocabulary is gone <laughs> yeah. i'm just like yeah mm, thank it you is so true that i, I will say when i do my so my when, when i do my full show, show i don't want to go to an after party uh, okay, no. yeah. if, if i've done 20 minutes and i'm like yeah let's go but when i've literally done 90 minutes i'm like i'm going to sleep guys yeah, <laughs> for a couple of days yeah, even. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, what I enjoy a lot, and uh, this is, I read this also in a book by uh, uh, Patton Oswalt. Yes, yes. Uh, and yeah. he has a book called uh, something with film addiction. Uh, some, yeah, it's a really nice book. I just started reading it, and uh, he said that for comedy, you have two things that he likes, and it's number one, it's the stage, mm-hmm. and number two, it's the hang. So yeah. oh, the yeah. hang, like Afterwards. the hang with the other comedians, <laughs> yeah. and that's what I love about uh, lineup shows or like yeah, uh, you know, like true. open podiums or yeah. like you, you know you hang with the other comedians yeah. and there's like this feeling. I mean, for me at least, there's like this feeling. Oh, there's a crowd waiting for us, yeah. and oh, we get to entertain them yeah. and let's go, guys. I mean, green obviously. rooms are wonderful. Yes, wonderful. Really? It's not what I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. no, no, I think uh, I always tell the same joke. Sometimes uh, hell is for me. A green room at, no. the, at the comedy. Why? It depends. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. It depends really. Yeah. Or, or oh, it depends on the comedians. You mean? It depends, it depends on the comedian because they are always on. They are always trying to be the funny person. I'll tell you what's wonderful them, though. But there are a couple. No, but them, what I love is when it's like a group of comedians mm-hmm. hanging out and start telling stories. That's, yes. That's because great. one thing I will say that's, is comedians are. Super storytellers because yeah. the entire yeah, yeah, job yeah, yeah, yeah. has made you good at telling stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when people just start trading stories, yeah. it's funnier than the show. 100%. Yeah. There are green rooms where I've been like, 100%. those poor guys are paid exactly. for I'm missing out um, for half as funny as what is going on yeah, back here because yeah, exactly. everyone is just oh, it's so great. Yeah. We have a, um, do you know television program Green Room? 
uh, I've not watched uh, the green room. It's it's just exactly that. It's about uh, backstage comedians just uh, sharing stories, and I did it last year, the live version, and I was uh, I was so enjoying it. I forgot I was um, on the show. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I love those nights. But the green room sometimes could be very. Uh, depends. It depends. Who. Like again, there are some people who are uh, okay. There's some, there also there's some people where if they're in the green room, I don't go in the green room. Okay. I'll go sit, stand at the back because there are people who are very. I'm not bothered by people trying to one up, but what I don't like is there's a lot of people who do passive aggressive yes. kind of jokes uh, okay. which are kind of mean yeah, yeah, yeah. and they they're like oh they're joking but i'm yeah, like it's yeah, yeah. just cutting exactly. and I'm, I'm not in the mood for that kind yeah, of, yeah. Uh, you don't want to have your energy drained yeah, yeah for having to yeah. bullying and and kind of like um yeah. trying to assert their machismo backstage but exactly. it's, again i would say it's not the majority most no, people no, no, no. also i think uh what i noticed uh in uh, so this thing you're talking about about like uh, sometimes it's like like toxic masculinity sometimes it's yeah. macho stuff yeah. um i feel like i don't know how you feel uh, i don't even maybe it's because i'm a woman but i feel like in belgium we don't have this a lot because the our scene is so small exactly right. it's, it's so small exactly. so there's no there's some competition which is also healthy keeps you on your feet but it's not like Oh, there's, there's so, so many, many of us, and no, there's just a few no, no, spots. No, no. no, there's like yeah. if you take like professional comedians yeah. who make their living at it, there's maybe 20. Yeah, on the Flemish side, I don't exactly. know about the yeah, yeah. Side. There's just 20. When, but when I go to Holland, I notice like, there's a difference. So, yeah. There's a difference mm -hmm. even amongst the open micers. There's more like a oh, we have to fight for our place. And like, exactly. And I actually I'm lucky that I live in Belgium because I love competition. Like I've, I'm a breaker yeah. as well. I love battles. I love you, you know, know, like, like clashing with other people and let's see just, just for this one moment who's better, better than the other one. But I don't, don't like it as a state of mind. Because then, then for me personally, personally some people grow on this, like they thrive on this. Mm -hmm. For me, it's, 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 it destroys me to, to compare myself. I'll tell you what I was terrible at. You mentioned battles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't realize how terrible I would be at. I did a, a roast battle. Oh, really? Yeah. And I was like, oh, wow. I would never say that you would be a roast battle I was comedian. atrocious. I was terrible because, again... Because you're a nice person. Look at you. Yeah, but you know what's funny? is. Oh, my God. But I'm a joke writer, right? So I wrote the jokes. But then I was like, I, I had no interest. I was terrible. And it was just amazing because you think that... In my head, I was like, oh, it's just being funny. I can do it. And then I was like, wow, I'm really not that person. I was atrocious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's also, uh, yeah, the roast battle thing, uh, I've done a couple of them as well, but in the end, I think I don't like it because I love roasts. Let's say three of us are best friends and we're going to roast you because it's your birthday. That's the... Yes. I, that's super, super fun, fun because okay. it means they know exactly. each other. You, you have, have to know each other real. You, you have to yeah, know yeah. each other exactly. really because well. Exactly. Because otherwise, it, also when I watch these roast battles on TV, like the J Jeff Ross ones, mm -hmm. uh, like on the internet, yeah. I just if it's really superficial, superficial. Yeah. Also, I find the other thing is it always is like racism, sexism, yeah, 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 yeah. homophobia. And it's not really because you're joking, but it's like, it's yeah. almost like giving people a pass yeah. Yeah. that for this one hour, you can say yeah. the most unacceptable stuff. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, but, but it's still just saying it. I watched one of those American ones, a roast of uh, Hugh Hefner or something like that. And it was just, I was like, this is the, for, so for the black people, it was just jokes about, how they're thieves and they're whatever. Yeah. For the Mexican, yeah. it was just like, oh, you're lazy, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the women, uh, it's like, oh, you, you're a slut and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, is this really comedy? Like yeah, comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, there are people who do more with it yes, than that. They go deeper. They go deeper. Yeah, yeah, but it's just one of those things where, now, that wasn't what I wrote when I was doing it. I just realized I didn't have the aggression to do it well. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's just a very odd thing. It's very popular. Audiences yeah, yeah, yeah. love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, I think it has, has to do, do with uh, uh, having, having the freedom to say anything. Anything. And, and that's, that's the that's, that's something, something yeah. weird because, because do we need to have the need of yeah to say everything? Well, is I it, think this is the thing is uh, mm. behind closed doors among friends mm -hmm. that exists. Because with your friends, you can say anything. And yes. people cross all the lines all the time. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we should have that in 
Well, I don't think necessarily it makes sense to have that in like the public yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In like, if if we are all watching television, do we need to hear everything? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like. But that's the yeah. that's the thing w where we fail as a society that we somewhere need to bring it back in balance there's somewhere but it's always like, but it's always going to be a, yeah. a, a a conversation when i was a kid people were protesting madonna people were protesting yeah, exactly. eminem yeah. you know what i mean like and nowadays oh, yeah, people yeah people yeah, are yeah. protesting different people and social media makes it seem more prevalent than it but i'm like this has been an eternal human thing true like elvis presley true. was devil music right shakespeare you, was yeah uh, <laughs> exactly it's 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 an eternal thing where we are like this is acceptable this isn't acceptable and i think it's entirely normal yeah right so i think when people get upset at like a comedian or an artist i think it's normal you know what i mean that what the good thing though is like it's not like lenny bruce's time where they're being imprisoned yeah what happens is you just get tweeted a lot about maybe you yeah. lose a contract yeah You know what I mean, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. which hurts, but it's saying at least they're not arresting us, right? So, like, yeah. if right now I say something totally unacceptable, mm -hmm. right, which reverberates all over Twitter, what will happen is I'll lose maybe five gigs. Yeah. Maybe but I won't be booked for something, yeah. but I'll still have a career. Yeah. I think also what's the dif difficult thing about Twitter is, um, or social media where you write text, you know, in general, yeah. but especially Twitter, um, is, you know, before we had social media, Um, you would just obviously you just say your opinion to your friends yeah. and you would say stupid everyone said stupid, stupid stuff stupid exactly. stuff exactly. when you're 15 yeah I hate these people You've, everyone said stupid stuff but it's just now because in our minds especially for us like our generation everything that's written is important yeah. books get that got printed like Uh, newspapers, everything yeah. that got printed, oh, it got printed, which means it's, it's important. important. Yeah. But now we have Twitter, we have social media, where anyone can write anything, but we still have that same yeah. reflex. Yeah. Oh, it's written, so this is important. But, but, but it, you know, no, if I write down, oh, I just ate spaghetti, spaghetti. Obviously, obviously it's not important. important. Yeah. It's written. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, oh, oh it's, it's, written. Yeah. it's written. It's written, but it's really kind of like a spoken word. word. Something that should be erased straight away. Exactly. The other problem, like Snapchat, the other like problem is, hour, is that people you know? roll with their video cameras, right? Yeah. yeah. Because do you remember when Michael Richards, the guy who used to be Kramer, uh, Kramer on, uh, had like a racist rant? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Love Factory. Now, I can tell you this. If this was 30 years ago, it, it would be a story, story which people tell. You're like, I was once at the Laugh Factory. This guy went crazy. Yeah. And that would be it. He'd yeah. still have a career. But yeah. because yeah. it's the current age, people filmed him and then that footage was played a million times. Yeah. Exactly. It's just life is not always meant to be registered. Yeah. It's yeah, just, definitely. But then I'm almost, I almost live in this fear now because oh, yeah, yeah. you're uh, aware now. Like my career is going well, and so now let's say I'm backstage and a subject comes up. You know, comedians will talk about yeah, yeah, of pedophilia or, exactly. or like whatever. People, comedians like talking about terrible things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'll be quiet because I'll be like, someone could be filming this. It's going to derail everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going, I'm just going, shut up right now. And I never, I used to just jump straight in, right? But now I'm like... I did a joke about Christchurch and now I'm realizing, oh my God, if somebody would uh, film it, exactly. it's going to be... <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. And there, there is this thing where there are subjects which I always used to jump into. Mm-hmm that I'm a little more careful when I jump into now. Okay, yeah. Like, so, like, I wrote some a routine about, there was this, this I don't know if you read about it here, there was this um, ISIS bride who wanted to come back to England, oh, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I still did jokes about it, but I did them much more carefully than I would have four years ago. I would have just gone like, ah, let's see what happens. But now I'm like, well, people are paying attention to what I say. Let me make sure that I say it right and I yeah, call yeah. different people and try to... And that's fine. It's just like, uh, it's a privilege that people are paying attention to what I say. Definitely. But it also means that I can't just say anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But isn't it part of the joke to be like very strong or really the the surprise if we if you look at uh, the setup versus the punchline well isn't i can't just do something for shock anymore okay not that i did that a lot but mm -hmm. i need i need to have a reason to bring up a contentious mm -hmm. subject mm -hmm. which i didn't necessarily need to when people weren't paying attention yeah but now i'm like well people might retweet this or watch it so i need to 
But again, I think this is a privilege. I just need to be a bit exactly. more careful what I say. And and I don't. I'll tell you what. The, I'll tell you what the difference is. If four years ago, I'd always end up with the same joke, right? Mm-hmm. But I could fail a few times publicly before I got it right. Yeah. yeah. Now I can't fail those times publicly. I need to oh, fail no. in private because yeah. if I go to an open mic and I mm-hmm. try out a joke in a very early stage, yeah. mm. right? And this has happened to comedians, right? Yeah, yeah. And someone films it. And then people start commenting on that, not realizing that's draft one. That yeah, wouldn't yeah, have yeah. been the final version which got to the DVD. Yeah. Yeah. So now sometimes what you end up doing is you end up on the phone to friends doing version one and version two. And by the time you do it in a comedy club, they're getting a bit more, more of a more of a more constructed of a... version. And yeah. that's fine. It's just I kind of I love that. I loved when I could just go walk in and try it at a yeah, yeah at an open mic, just yeah. walk inside. Yeah. And just, uh, how is it? In, uh, how do you choose your uh, your comedy buddy? Is it is he also a comedian? Oh or no, no, yeah, yeah. no. I've got comedians who I get along with, and sometimes we we, we talk about jokes and okay. stuff like that. And um, and again, this is a temporary thing, and it's linked to, and it's like now I probably be, it's linked to how many people are paying attention. Okay. Right. So, like, if Chris Rock walks into a show, so, everything he says is going to be reported on. But it's, a, it's really weird for him to try out a joke or try out an idea, right? Yeah, true. And then, if you are a total open micer, you can literally come out and talk about the most crazy stuff, and yeah. nobody cares. So, it's, but and that's just reality. You've got to understand where you are. How is it internationally? Oh, go ahead. I think uh, about the. Um, the the really uh, touchy subject or not touchy that makes it sound really negative but like the you know like the controversial the controversial yeah, yes. exactly yeah. the controversial subject I also I remember I was at this podcast taping in New York not as a guest but just to watch <laughs> <laughs> um, and they were talking about this really horrible clip of this girl that was uh, it was a a volcano that erupted okay mm-hmm. and it was a really horrible clip of this girl that was stuck somewhere you know. And then they were laughing about this. But then I have to admit, I was laughing as well. Yeah. And then I talked to my psychologist after because... Okay, felt because really, you're so traumatized. Yeah, it felt really, really bad. Yeah, like, okay. oh, I'm laughing so much. I was, someone, yeah, it was really awful. Like, these, these images are really awful. And, uh, and she said, well, that's also, like, when you see something really horrible... Uh, there's, there's like, there's, like there's your, your body gives you two options. options like either you go into the yeah. deep end and like just mm-hmm. crash and like cry and or your body's like let's, let's laugh let's just laugh, laugh. Yeah. let's just let's, let's just push this away, away with laughter yeah. you know yeah. like yeah. and not that you don't have to realize what's yeah. really going on but you're laughing at it yeah there's no in between and i was thinking there's no in between i cannot watch these i cannot watch this footage and just be like Oh, oh yeah. Okay. okay. No, there's, there's only, only two, two extremes. extremes. Yeah. So and also, feel... you know, whenever a tragedy happens, mm-hmm. people send you horrible jokes. jokes. Yeah. Oh, is it? Do, do you not yeah, get? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Michael, Michael Jackson. Jackson. When Michael Jackson died, uh, I was sitting with another yeah. comedian. We were having after a gig. Within a second, fifty, fifty. Yeah, exactly. Really? But do you mean like just people or other comedians? Comedians. It's people. comedian. It's people. And, and these things, things get shared. And, and I always think it's funny when people get really angry that someone did a joke about uh, a tragedy or something. I'm like, do you not have the same things happening to you on social media that I do? It's like horrible stuff is being sent to you. And I think it's because we don't know how to process it. And, and, and people just write horrible things. Like there's a very popular site. What's it called? Something like... Um, Horrible.com. What's um, it like? Like, do you, you know, if leak or something, I forgot or what it's e-bombs. called, but it's a site which is just horrible stuff, and people love it. People go there, yeah. and people like, you know, the day after the crisis issue, I'm sure people yeah. were doing horrible jokes there, but I think it's like, I think people misunderstand it because it's not saying that people aren't saying what they believe. No, they're saying something atrocious because they don't know how to cope with it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, they're trying to find. The, the the stuff w- where they can uh, relative it, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's also a reality yeah, which I think, I think sometimes, sometimes we we don't really engage with. Where, where to most, most people's lives, lives it's, it's just a news story. True. It's, it's just, just a bunch of words which gets in, in if, if evokes yeah. a certain yeah. thing. And, and so, so 
one can laugh at it in a way you wouldn't laugh if it's your family. Yes. Right? Yeah. And that is there's there is something in that where all these emotional things happen which affect us. And mm-hmm. sometimes by making a joke, people are reminding themselves that I don't know any of these people. Right? Yeah, 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 you know what I mean? It's like yeah. but I don't know necessarily I don't know if it's right. I don't know if it's right because a lot of these jokes are terrible. They're mm-hmm. bad. They're, they're not yeah, even. Yeah, yeah. They're not. Joke, not even good they're jokes. not well written. Mm-hmm. They're yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. They're making fun of victims, not of victimized. They, yeah. But again, these are not. I've never seen a comedian doing this. It's just I get a text. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it's yeah. like, and I'm just like, oh, what's this? And it's just, but it happens after everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So maybe a part of uh, the human condition, trying to figure out what. Uh, they what they need to know, uh, mm-hmm. survive. We're, We're good. good. We're wrapping up. We're wrapping right. it. Wrapping up. Okay. That was fun. That was long. Yeah. It was longer than I thought. 